It was July 2nd, late evening and very dark. The crew strolled aboard in small groups, as inconspicuously as possible, so as not to suggest to the French dockhands of the night shift that we might be sailing. At midnight we removed the lines from the pillars. I brought the boat out of the bunker and navigated her into the wall of the night. It was not quite two o'clock July 3rd, when U-415, still without schnorkel, began her final voyage. As soon as we had a safe depth of water under the keel, U-415 submerged. To conserve power, we floated with minimum revolutions, riding the outgoing tide westward. My instructions were to operate in a 200-square-mile area approximately 80 miles west of the coast, and to keep the entrance to Brest Harbour clear of enemy destroyers and landing parties. U-415 was now the ghost of a boat. With her movements greatly curtailed, with her combat readiness doubtful, with her basic needs to surface and replenish air and electric power challenged constantly by British planes, she had become a floating coffin, poised for the attack that would send her down to her grave. When the tide broke and a new day dawned, I put U-415 aground to await high water at noon. Her stem touched the sandy soil like a grazing horse. I had all motors and auxiliaries turned off, sent all hands to their bunks. With the renewal of the outgoing tide, I lifted the boat off ground, floated further out to sea, then put her aground again. I repeated the pattern at regular intervals. During the second night, we risked five endless minutes on surface, replenishing our air. We dived under a clamour of radar impulses and continued our silent run close to the bottom. Occasional detonations, originating in the English Channel, reminded us that the British all too often caught up with a target. After 40 hours, U-415 reached her allotted area. With lowest revolutions, we proceeded north 30 metres below the surface. No trace of propeller noise was picked up by our sound gear. As the day dwindled and the moment for surfacing approached, our hearts beat faster, harder. Then we surfaced into a quiet night. For a little more than 20 minutes, the Tommies left us unmolested. Then they came in large numbers. We crash-dived. The moment that the sea laid its cover over our boat, a hail of bombs and depth charges came thundering down. The sudden impact was too much for my new chief. With the boat out of control, he sent us on a roller coaster ride which threatened alternately to ram her into the bottom and to throw her back to surface for the final blow. Shouting commands, I leaped into the chief's postion, tamed the boat's wild motions, and trimmed her until she floated quietly on even keel. Then, with a deep sigh, I told my stunned chief, Take it from here, Selda, and keep it this way. Still shaken by the explosions, he took over control. This had been his first bombardment, his first brush with death. I knew that I had to tolerate his inexperience and would have to give him many more chances to adjust. With this opening barrage, the dance macabre began. Throughout the night, we fought fanatically for the surface, for power and for air. An hour before dawn, on our final trip to the surface for the night, we almost completed charging our batteries. After the last deafening spread, we remained in protective depth, weary, exhausted, fatigued. The third day at sea, and the fourth, did not bring the Allied destroyers we had been sent to destroy. On the night between, I put the boat aground, and only the breathing of the crew and the soft grinding of the bow rotating in the sand was heard. But the next night, our need for air and power dictated another series of struggles to the surface and crash dives in the teeth of exploding charges. Through it all, U-415 waited in vain for naval units to attack. While the Royal Air Force spared no effort to sink us and other lone wolves, the British Navy ignored us completely. Not a single ship entered our area. I operated precariously in the square for an entire week without seeing or hearing a destroyer or an allied landing craft. During the ninth night of the fruitless operation, I challenged the Tommy's aircraft by signalling base. No traffic in area. Send new orders. Immediately after transmitting the message, we dived and floated at a scant 25 metres, awaiting headquarters' answer. The reply instructed us to return to Brest. We made the journey back into port in just 42 hours, hopping and floating with the rising tide into the narrows of Brest. It was late evening, July 13th, 
when we arrived at the pickup point. A quick rise, a fast answer to the escort's challenge, and U-415 made her last dash into port. At 22.35, I manoeuvred my boat into the bunker, under the protection of a concrete ceiling seven metres thick. The engine stopped. The eerie light cast dark shadows on the yellow faces of my men as Capitaine Winter walked over the gangplank. He accepted my report and welcomed the crew with a smile, but was unable to conceal his grave concern. After he had passed the files, he turned toward me and said with a subdued voice, You've been called back to prepare for a special task. Get together with my chief engineer to determine the major problems, those which require immediate attention and can be taken care of quickly. You have to be equipped for patrol in three days. That's all the time we can give you. I saluted and climbed to the bridge. Here the flotilla's engineer was talking to my chief, and I heard him say, And I suggest taking the boat out to the bay as early as seven. Any objections? It was I who had objections. I had not slept for ten days, and the crew also needed rest and a chance to see the sun. To my exec, I said grimly, have the boat ready for manoeuvres at nine sharp, and have Cook awake me at seven. Any more questions? None whatsoever, sir. All right, dismiss the men, and make sure that there are no drinking parties tonight, or I'll have to withhold some special privileges. Through the nebulous veil of my slow awakening, I heard the boom of many depth charges. The last booms forced my eyes open. I realised that I was not at sea, but in my quarters in port, and that someone was hammering on my outer door. Still groggy, I staggered across the room, opened the inner door, and shouted into the vestibule, That's enough, I've heard you! A steward's voice penetrated the outer door. Sir, you were supposed to sail at nine, and it's already ten. Since seven this morning, we've been trying to get you out of bed. Thanks. Please call the bunker and tell my exec I shall be down in ten minutes. Angry at my slip-up, I dressed speedily, rushed down the staircase five steps at a time, into the blazing sun, and down the serpentine path to the bunker. As I made the turn into the large doorway, I spotted my boat. She was sailing stern first into the inner basin, with diesels fuming. My temper flared. The exec had no right to take the boat out without my specific instruction. Just as I thought about setting him straight, a thunderous explosion rocked the air. A huge fountain shot skyward out of the spot where my boat just had been. Then it had to be a hallucination. The stern of U-415 was lifted out of the water like a log, heaving two of my men through the air. The geyser collapsed and showered the boat. U-415 had been hit by a mine. She swerved to starboard and reached for the long stone jetty which enclosed the inner harbour. For a moment, I was the paralysed witness to the killing of my boat. Recovering, I jumped into a motor launch and chased after U-415. She floated toward the pier head, then smashed head-on into the stone wall. At that moment, I came alongside. Machinists and seamen poured out of the conning tower hatch, bleeding pale and shaken. Some were limping. Others crawled, dragging their legs. The boat began to list to port. I ran against the stream of outpouring casualties, climbed to the bridge, and hauled the struggling men through the narrow hatch. There are more in the aft compartments, dead or unconscious, said a machinist. Move them into the control room, I ordered. The man did not respond. He had blacked out. The parade of the wounded continued to come up the aluminum ladder. Some men had their arms broken, others their legs. As the flow from below ceased, I dropped into the control room, followed by two uninjured petty officers. The boat was a ruin. Overhead pipes, ducts, conduits, switches, hand wheels and equipment lay piled on the floor plates and in the bilges. Dirty, stinking water flashed through a large crack in the hull into the aft torpedo room, flooding the boat rapidly. Three men lay near death on the deck plates in the diesel room. Two more were sprawled unconscious, jammed between the motors in the aft compartment. While the boat filled with oily water and slumped gradually to port, the three of us dragged the heavy machinists to the bow compartment. Someone had opened the forward hatch, which was still above water level. With the help of many hands, we hoisted the machinists out of the drum and placed them into one of the several launches which had come alongside. U-415 listed dangerously her stern already swallowed by the sea. 
As I crossed over into a launch, the good old workhorse slipped off the stones and spun to port. Her deck disappeared in the murky waters. Then, with a last convulsive heave, the conning tower and bridge flipped over and the whole boat disappeared below surface. U-415 was dead. I was still staring at the spot above her grave when the motorboat touched the pontoon and my exec approached, limping and badly shaken. My temper rose again over his unauthorised and unorthodox manoeuvre, and I said angrily, I'll put you on the carpet for this exec. Sir, the flotilla's chief engineer ordered me to take the boat out of her mooring. He had waited an hour for you. He got impatient. The chief isn't your superior exec. He can't give you any orders as far as the boat is concerned. You should know better. Now get all the uninjured together and count them. I'll accompany the wounded to the hospital. Sir, I think we've lost two men. Yes, I saw them flying through the air. Take a boat and cruise around. You might find them floating. Take care of their bodies and notify me at once. The great explosion had attracted men from other U-boats as well as dock workers, shipyard personnel and staff officers in blues. Helping hands were many. As we carried the serious cases into waiting ambulances, I had a chance to inspect their injuries. All of them had broken legs, their feet dangled backward, their toes pointing in the wrong direction. Some had obviously received internal injuries and they moaned in pain. Others, unconscious and bleeding from the head, seemed to have fractured skulls. I settled in an ambulance beside a severely injured electrician's mate and we raced through the streets of Brest with sirens screaming. It dawned on me then that this was July 14th, Bastille Day, and that U-415 had died as a British present for the French people. My boat had become the victim of the mine dropped during the night of May 28th. Her pounding diesels had activated the mine's acoustical timing device. Yet, I suddenly realised that her fate had been merciful. U-415 had not been sunk at sea, where all of us would have been entombed. She had perished in port, where our chances for survival were the greatest. Why had I failed to awake in time? Why had the exec given in to the chief engineer? And why had he used the diesels instead of the quiet electric motors? Those questions rose in my tortured mind. And why had I survived thousands of blows at sea while others had to die? It seemed that neither hell nor heaven wanted any part of me. When I arrived at the hospital, some of my men were already on the operating table. The five we had rescued from the aft compartments were still unconscious. The broken legs and arms were not serious, but the doctors said that two men had broken backs. Others had skull fractures, concussions, various head cuts injuries received when they were thrown against the plates. When I departed, I left 14 of my crew behind. Back in the compound, I met a distraught Capitan Winter. His chief engineer had told him that he had delivered the fatal order. Since the flotilla's engineer was second in command of the base, Winter found himself in an awkward situation. I was in no position to press charges against a superior under the circumstances. I could only effect my exec's dismissal. However, I forgave the exec, reasoning that he lacked the confidence to contradict the chief engineer, telling myself that he had only executed the order of a higher authority. The loss of U-415 soon became just another statistic in the dismal obliteration of our U-boat force. During the first two weeks of July, the period of my last patrol, we had lost 11 non-schnorkel boats, almost the entire complement then sailing. Two more schnorkel boats had been sunk in the channel, reducing the anti-invasion group to a mere five. With the death of U-415, U-413 was the only survivor out of the eight schnorkelous boats that had sailed in the evening of June 6th. U-413 still lay in the shipyard awaiting completion of repairs. In the meantime, the five remaining schnorkel boats used their air masts to remain submerged and to avoid destruction from above. They continued their missions in the channel and even achieved some success. U-953 sank three destroyers. U-984 sent three freighters and one frigate to the bottom. U-763 sank three cargo ships and one corvette. During these disastrous two weeks, no more than three or four U-boats at a time were attacking the convoys, ferrying invasion supplies between the southern English ports and the Normandy beaches. 
Close to 100 U-boats would have been there if they had not been senselessly sacrificed. With the U-boat collapse matched by the failure of the Luftwaffe, the Allies lost very little of their supply at sea, and new Allied divisions, fully equipped and with thousands of tanks and vehicles, poured ashore over huge pontoon piers that had been floated to the coast of France. Cherbourg was soon taken by the Allies, thus securing a major base for their gigantic operations. Our armies had been unable to prevent the Anglo-American forces from driving deep wedges through our lines and into the French interior. Avranches had fallen, and American units were advancing along the north shore of Brittany, coming ever closer to Brest. The day after the destruction of U-415, I made the first of many trips to the hospital to look after my injured men. I found most of them in fair condition, their arms and legs in casts. The five most severely injured lay entirely enveloped in plaster. Two of them were still unconscious 32 hours after the blast. I distributed a large supply of cigarettes and tobacco. It was all I could do for the innocent victims of an ignorant mistake. When I returned to the compound, one of my petty officers told me that the British radio station, Calais, had made a broadcast about us that morning. Sir, the announcer said that you sank U-415 yourself, so that you wouldn't have to sail again with an obsolete boat. I smiled and said, Now you see how fast the English get their information and twist it around. It should be a warning to all of you. I spent day after day waiting impatiently for my new command, preparing the remainder of my crew for an imminent train ride to Germany. While headquarters struggled to decide my fate, I saw Heinz Siede return from his mission, greeted Marbach at the pier, listened to Cordes's homecoming report. We four celebrated their successes, trying to recapture the good old days with much champagne and a sumptuous seafood dinner. If any one of us celebrants feared that the war would come to a horrible end, he never admitted it, not even to himself. As of then, we remained hopeful and convinced of eventual victory. I was certain that the war would take a dramatic turn once our wonder U-boats were available in great numbers, and I believed that I would soon be sailing one of them. Then came July 20th. That afternoon, after I had returned from a visit to my men in the hospital, a steward told me to meet Capitan Winter in the officers' mess hall. To my astonishment, I found the flotilla's entire contingent of officers and warrant officers assembled there. Everyone realised that only an event of far-reaching consequences could have sparked the meeting. The guesses were many, and tensions high when Winter entered the mess hall with his staff. Winter's face was stony as he demanded attention. Mine Heron, I have the duty to inform you of the contents of a teletype I have received from Admiral U-Boats. This morning, an attempt has been made on the Führer's life. However, he escaped injury. The would-be assassin, an army officer, has been captured. I can assure you that the Navy had no part in the plot. Gentlemen, there will be no change whatsoever. The war will go on until final victory. The disclosure shocked the crowd. The fact that someone had tried to kill the idol of the nation was beyond comprehension. Our reactions ranged from disbelief to deep concern. The assembly dispersed in confusion and anger. The news soon echoed throughout the compound. The crews were told immediately before they could be surprised by propaganda on the British radio station, Calais. I retreated into my room bewildered. Of course I knew that there was a certain amount of discontent at home. That was only natural during a long, hard war with many casualties and widespread devastation. But I had never thought that there was an organised opposition that would plot treason and attempt open rebellion. While I feared that German morale would suffer as a result of the assassination attempt, we soon found out that it produced only one visible change in Navy life. The military salute was abolished, and the party's manner of saluting was made obligatory in all branches of the armed forces. As a result, a perplexing and amusing situation often arose as the traditional salute was quite frequently executed to return somebody's new-style greeting. Otherwise, the war went on as usual deteriorating steadily. Then began a time of sad farewells. On July 21st, two tugs dragged U-415 along the bottom of the harbour into dry dock. I was instructed to secure her valuable instruments and confidential material. 
Taking my officers and the available crewmen, I went to the dock. We found the boat lying on her starboard side. The rear of the hull was split wide open, ribs were cracked, the aft tanks were torn apart, the shafts were bent, and rudder and hydroplanes were cut off at the hull. All that remained of U-415 was scrap. I left the supervision of the work to my deputies and turned my back on the boat. Two days later, the sea released the bodies of our two seamen who had been killed by the blast. A minesweeper on perpetual clean-up duty brought them into port. On July 25th, we buried our dead in the small cemetery of a suburb nearby. My battered crew came in navy blues, some with their arms in casts, to pay their last respects to the two who had to die for no reason at all. Winter laid down his wreath. Then, under a volley from twenty-four rifles, the wooden coffins were slowly lowered into earth. Before the day came to an end, I addressed myself to the difficult task of writing to the parents of the dead. What could I say to parents who, if their sons must die, wanted them to die as heroes in combat? I unfolded the fine letter paper with the thin black line around the edges and the black iron cross in the upper left-hand corner and began to write. I was still struggling with my sentences long after midnight. I was not sorry to see July come to an end. As usual in recent months, conditions were worsening at an accelerating rate. Strong Allied forces, spreading out from Normandy against only light resistance, threatened to cut Brittany off from the rest of France, thus denying US access to Germany. Our most important U-boat bases on the Atlantic coast came under greater peril every day. These bases, the once lively ports of Brest, Lorient and Saint-Nazaire, were practically dead already along with their U-boat flotillas. In July alone, 18 more boats had been sunk, most of them by air attack. Among this number were the obsolete, schnorkelless U-212 and U-214, which had sailed from Brest to keep our front yard free of Allied naval units. British destroyers, which had begun to tighten the noose around our port, had sent the pair to the bottom. In July too, I had bade farewell to my friends Sachs of U-413, and Cedar of U-984. Their patrols were lone wolf affairs, but both boats with all hands were destroyed on one and the same day. With the departure of my closest friends, I felt increasingly superfluous. Headquarters still had made no decision as to the future of my crew or myself. In vain, Capitaine Winter had intervened in our behalf. With nothing else to do, I prepared myself for a war on land. A siege of Brest was impending. As American tanks rolled south through the highlands of Brittany, our troops began to withdraw into Brest, which was declared a fortress. The feverish work of building up the city's defences went on everywhere. My men were issued rifles and machine guns, and I was told to train them for ground fighting. Our prospects of being trapped and captured in Fortress Brest seemed all too good. One day in early August, I was returning from field exercises with my men, when word came that I was to report to the commanding officer. Winter received me with a rare smile on his face. You are a lucky man. You have been appointed captain of U-953. Congratulations. I was stunned and elated. Marbach, the boat's captain, had journeyed to headquarters in Berlin to accept the Knight's Cross, that much I knew. I discovered that his return had been prevented by the Allied advances. You'll take over her crew in an hour, continued Winter. The boat, as you know, is equipped with a schnorkel, and her repairs will be completed in about ten days. Prepare yourself for an exciting job. Sir, I am delighted. The new order completely reversed the outlook for my immediate future. Instead of being trapped in Fortress Brest, instead of being killed on land or humiliated in an Allied prison camp, I would at least be able to fight and die on the seas. This was what I knew and where I belonged. At the designated hour, I took over the helm of Marbach's boat. Most of the crew already knew me or had heard of me, and this, together with the mounting Allied threat, prompted the men to accept their new captain with relief and with hope. Since a portion of the crew had gone on leave and presumably would be unable to return, I filled the ranks with machinists and seamen of U-415, who had taken a jealous interest in my new boat. In preference to fighting on land, they would gladly have sailed a dinghy to sea to fight British destroyers. 
The days now passed rapidly in preparations for our sailing. My composite crew worked desperately to beat the clock and to offset the increasing shortage of reliable, experienced shipyard personnel. More and more of our French workers were encouraged by the Allied advances to abandon their conquerors. Some of them actually ran away during lunchtime. Worse, those who remained behind were more hostile than trustworthy, and they had to be watched constantly. Moreover, the remainder of my crew from U-415 were sent to the outer trenches of Brest, and those left at my disposal were pestered constantly by German civil employees, who offered large bribes to be smuggled aboard when we dashed out of the trap. Under these hectic conditions, it was impossible for us to meet our sailing schedule. Brest awaited the enemy. More and more of our troops poured into the city as fast-moving Allied units fanned out from Normandy, threatened Paris, surrounded Lorient and reached for Saint-Nazaire. The citizens of Brest now stayed in their houses and waited developments with a mixture of fear, eagerness and stoicism. Too late, headquarters ordered all U-boats to evacuate Brest, Lorient and Saint-Nazaire. By then, the British had anticipated Dönitz's command and had sealed off our escape routes. Strong destroyer forces had steamed south, surrounding and besieging the three ports. Night after night, Allied aircraft dropped their mines into navigable waters, stopping all surface traffic and making the U-boats' comings and goings a fatal proposition. In addition to the hunt at sea, the Royal Air Force attacked all bases repeatedly and in great strength. The tragic remnants of a glorious fleet that once numbered several hundred U-boats now postponed their destruction by lurking in bunkers under cover of seven metres of concrete. On August 13th, at 10.45, the air raid sirens howled through our compound in Brest. I took cover in the tunnels carved into the hill. Fierce shooting erupted almost at once. From the entrance of the tunnel, I stared out at a swarm of about 24 engined liberators. They were flying at medium altitude into the concentrated gunfire of our heavy flak, they drew closer, disregarding the black mushrooms bursting around them, stubbornly holding course and altitude. Suddenly, a wing sheared off a plane and glided through the air. The aircraft followed it, spinning and tumbling toward the bay. The white dots of four parachutes unfurled in the sky just before the crippled plane crashed into the water. The British kept flying straight toward our U-boat bunker, aiming carefully. A second Liberator caught fire, swerved out of formation. A third plane exploded in mid-air. At that moment, each of the remaining aircraft released a single huge bomb. The bombs, clearly visible to me as I edged back further into the tunnel, angled toward the bunker below. Then the world was lifted off its hinges. Volcanic explosions rocked the hill and made the air tremble. The hard pressure waves hit us with staggering force and took our breath away. Tall fountains of dust and debris rose toward our anti-aircraft blimps blotting out the entire panorama. A few more blasts from our AA guns, a low roar in the sky in the north, then silence. I dashed down the hill, concerned about my new boat. Climbing over masses of stone and broken cement, I rushed into the dark coolness of the bunker and found U-953 completely untouched, rocking gently in her berth. I continued down the long alleyway, past the numerous empty bays, until I reached a group of workers. They were staring at the ceiling, and I saw that the roof had a small fracture with reinforcing rods protruding. U-247, the only other boat in the bunker, had been thinly covered with cement dust. The six-ton bomb, the heaviest the Allies had available, had spent its fury harmlessly. Since this was the only hit on our installation, the enemy's enormous effort to root out the two remaining U-boats in port had resulted in a complete failure. I returned to my boat to check the progress of work, which I expected to be finished in four days. As I boarded U-953, the chief, who had served under Marbach, called me into the bow torpedo room. I lowered myself into the drum and stared into the yawning tunnel of a torpedo tube. The inner door had been broken away. The round cover, the only safety door besides the outer door, lay on the deck plates. I was puzzled and worried. That said the chief, is from the shock wave of a bomb that exploded in the basin some 50 metres away. I am sure that we have lost some of our boats this way. 
With their outer tube doors open and a faulty inner door, a single depth charge would do it. They never lived to tell what happened. Listen, I said. If our outer doors weren't tight, our boat would be lying on the bottom right now, and you and I would have to walk a long way back home. Check all doors and have this broken one replaced. And do it in a hurry. I don't want our sailing delayed any more. As in Brest, the Allied air attacks upon the U-boat bunkers in Lorient, Saint-Nazaire, La Palisse and Bordeaux produced little or no results. However, the Allied advances overland spread consternation. Everyone who could flee was scrambling from our threatened northern bases toward La Palisse and La Rochelle. These ports, having a common entrance between Ile de Ré and Ile d'Oléron, were as yet unbesieged by British naval units and still offered an escape route through France for those thousands of Germans who had been ordered to retreat. The twin ports had been selected by headquarters as a refuge for U-boats from the northern ports. Here our boats would receive whatever supplies and repairs they needed for their next mission. But the British Navy now ruled the waters off our northern ports, and our crews, leaving base in lame, half-repaired U-boats, stood little chance of reaching the twin ports safely. Those boats which were not sunk by blockading destroyers were destroyed by aircraft or shattered by mines. U-736, sailing from Lorient, was sunk on August 6th. U-608, following her, was destroyed at almost the same spot on August 10th. One day later, U-385 was blown to bits under a depth charge barrage. On August 12th, U-270 was sunk near Lorient, and U-981 struck a mine while trying to penetrate La Rochelle Harbour. On August 14th, U-618 was crippled by air attack and subsequently sunk by destroyers. On August 18th, U-107 succumbed to bombs, and U-621 fell victim to one of the most experienced killer groups to sail the Bay of Biscay. During those days of German decline, the collapse of our Atlantic defences was almost matched by defeats on other fronts. Soviet armies had recaptured the cities of Preskomysl, Bialystok, Kauno and Preskov, and were pressing their powerful offensive deeper into the old Russian territories. In Greece, our forces had suffered great setbacks, and Romania had gone over into the Allied camp. In Italy, our troops had withdrawn from Rome and were battling to hold new lines further north. To top off these defeats and the ensuing confusion, a strong American-French-British invasion force had landed on the Mediterranean coast between Nice and Toulon on August 15th, and Allied armoured units, racing north from this new front, threatened to cut off our divisions in western France. The U-boat base in Toulon was eliminated by the bombing and sinking of eight U-boats, among them the old U-230. As a result, the U-boat war in the Mediterranean ceased. The dismal picture was rounded out by our loss of all destroyers, coast guard vessels and minesweepers in French waters. With our retreats came confusion and even panic, and the atmosphere in Fortress Brest neared the explosion point. The city had been declared off-limits for our troops, a strict curfew had been imposed upon the population. The shipyard had been secured by marines. All anti-aircraft guns were relocated in strategic positions to reinforce the defence perimeter. Navy units, armed to the teeth, patrolled the city and its suburbs. The Naval College, the home of the once illustrious first U-boat flotilla, was chosen to serve as the centre of the defence of Brest because of its vast underground tunnel system. The 9th U-boat flotilla was dissolved, and its commander was ordered to leave port for Norway. As his last gesture, he succeeded in the nearly impossible task of refloating Boddenberg's U-256. This old boat, put in running order and even equipped with a schnorkel, eventually slipped out of port and broke through the British blockade near the rocks. Now Carr slash Itan Winter faced his finale. He transferred vital units of the first flotilla into the underground caves, managed with bravura to hold off the invasion of the German military. A large number of arrogant army officers, who had escaped the battles for the Reich's existence and who miraculously maintained their easy life in France, arrived in port with their French mistresses and baggage trains of personal belongings, wine and champagne. Some of the officers demanded U-boat transportation for all their possessions, and they were very indignant when winter turned them down. 
The situation assumed riotous proportions when the first shots were fired at the front lines and the first American Sherman tanks rumbled into view of the outer trenches. During these chaotic days, when the Navy was the only defender of Brest and nobody knew where the front lines were, or when the Allies would attack, only two U-boats remained in the beleaguered port, U-953 and U-247. The repairs that would permit them to make the run for freedom were nearing completion. U-247 was finished first and tried to make her break. She was lost with all of her crew. Now only my boat survived. On August 19th, U-953 was finally declared seaworthy with limitations. The diesels were in poorest condition. The batteries should have been replaced some time before, but there was no material, no replacements, no time or opportunity to make any kind of major repairs. Certainly we would have no chance for trim dives or schnorkel exercises. With the tireless effort of every hand aboard, we doubled our watch to prevent any attempt by the French underground to sabotage our boat at the pier, and we managed to fit her out with some food and fuel. I had been ordered, to my consternation, not to take aboard any torpedoes, but to load boat and tubes with all the engineering equipment and valuable instruments and key personnel that we could carry out of the trap. This precious freight we were then to transport south to La Rochelle, where the civilians might yet make a run across France for home and safety. I took a critical look at the situation and concluded that what was good for civilians was even better for the remainder of the crew of U-415. After obtaining Winter's permission to take them on board, I collected my loyal seamen at the trenches, drove heavily armed to the hospital, and said farewell to those crewmen whose wounds kept them there to face a long siege. Then I instructed my two crews to abandon all unnecessary items and supervised their exodus from the compound. As we arrived at the pier, I was confronted by a large group of weeping and gesticulating civilians, French and German alike, who tried to force their way aboard. My men pushed and tossed the frantic people back to the pier. Some were so desperate to escape that we had to keep them away from the boat at gunpoint. The crew quickly fell into line for roll call on the aft deck. Six civilians stood on the bridge, tense and seemingly lost. My exec reported the oversized crew for inspection. Together with the six civilians and myself, we were 99 heads 45 more than our normal complement. Hoping to discourage the people on the pier, I gave my grim instructions to the crew in a loud voice. I want to emphasise that this patrol will be one of our hardest. We'll sail with all hands on battle stations from pier to pier. The regular crew will maintain the controls while the crew of U-415 will help out in their normal jobs. You'll work, eat and sleep on action stations. There will be no walking, no unnecessary talking. Cans will be placed in convenient places for sanitary use. I want you to know that the coastal waters are crawling with enemy ships and our chances of surviving are very poor. The odds are ten to one that we won't break through three British blockades to reach La Rochelle, so don't have any illusions. You must be prepared for instant sailing. No one steps off the boat for any reason. I dismissed the men and turned toward the six civilians. For the first time they realised with horror the dangers they faced, and two of them grabbed their bags and hurried off the boat. I was amused and glad to see them go. It gave us just a little more room to breathe. The four courageous civilians followed me below deck. The centre aisle and all the compartments except the control room were piled high with large, bulky equipment, wooden boxes, suitcases and cartons. In the forward torpedo room, material had been stored in the bilges, spare torpedo racks and tubes. I told the four guests that this was their place to stay, and I left them standing there bewildered. Then I set off to report to Winter that we were ready to sail. As I climbed the serpentine path toward the compound, I heard the wind-blown bellowing of machine guns to the north and saw Winter's adjutant racing down the hill. He told me breathlessly that I had to take four more technicians out of portmen whom the Reich could not afford to lose to the Americans. Since these indispensable men could not join us before morning, our departure was postponed for 24 hours. I walked back to the boat thoroughly disgusted, for the longer I stayed in port, the harder it would be to break through the blockades to La Rochelle. Soon the aroma of goulash permeated the boat. 
The men, perching on boxes and suitcases and pipes and bunks, ate the dinner they had thought would be their last in port. Our radio played low and pleasant tunes. I was sitting at the, the small desk in my nook, planning our escape, when the music subsided and the announcer began to report the news. This broadcast is intended for our U-boat friends in Brest. The time has come to relieve you from fighting. If you sail out of port with a white flag fastened to your scope, we will treat you with respect. But should you choose to fight, you will face quick extinction. I say this expressly for you, men of U-953, who have to sail once again. I can tell you that dozens of our British destroyers are waiting to receive you, and they will sink you should you decide to continue your war. I warn you, it will be your last. I had heard enough and shouted angrily into the radio room. Tune that fool out and play some music. But sir, said a mate, it's the only station we receive inside the bunker. Then turn it off and put on some records. In the forenoon of August 21st, our last four tourists arrived with large quantities of luggage and instruments. I refused to allow them more personal gear than my men, and after a heated argument the newcomers parted with their private possessions. I confined them in the aft torpedo room and told them that they had to stay there, had to eat, sleep and possibly die there. Then I had the hull closed tight, the radio shut off and the batteries charged to top capacity. As I stepped off the boat, both diesels fumed and resounded in the hollow berth. I walked from the cool, dark bunker into blinding sunlight and summer heat and proceeded uphill to make my last report. The huge rock was swarming with men in army uniforms. A large number of officers wore dress uniforms fit for a gala evening at the Paris Opera, but not for the defence of Fortress Brest. Disorder and nervous tension were apparent everywhere. Army ambulances stopped in front of the underground tunnels, unloading the first casualties of the battle for Brest. Fierce fighting now raged along the outer trenches, and some American tanks had broken through into the vicinity of the compound. I rushed through the tunnel in search of Winter, but was told that he had gone to the compound. Following the booms of heavy anti-aircraft guns, I reached the deserted base just as a black mushroom cloud rose no more than 700 metres to the north. On the flat roof of the southeast wing, I saw some navy men with their glasses trained north toward the scene of action. I dashed up the staircase and found Winter. He and his staff were elated by the success of our guns. One American tank had been demolished as it made a run for the college. Winter was resigned to the fact that the defence of Brest and his one-boat flotilla had been assumed by an elderly, nervous, monocled general. I approached my commander and reported U-953 in sailing order. You may leave port at your discretion, said Winter. When do you propose to sail? After sunset, sir, at 21.30. I shall be there to see you off. But no commotion, please. I don't want to stir suspicion among the dockers. As we walked down the hill, the air raid sirens started screaming. We ran toward the entrance to the underground facilities. Moments later, the hill began to shake under an endless chain of terrific explosions. I followed Winter into the vast network of tunnels, past the many bunks already occupied by the first wounded of the battle. I had a glimpse of pale German nurses, whose future was gloomy. The dishevelled French girls, nervously awaiting their terrible fate as collaborators. Their vain cavaliers, haughtily stalking around in jackboots and splendid uniforms with red-striped trousers. The bewildered sailors and infantrymen, flitting about executing frantic orders. The bombardment went on relentlessly. Everything in the catacombs, the ground, the beds, the running men, was drowned in the fierce bellowing of the flak and shook in the continual vibrations of ponderous explosions. It was the beginning of the end of the fortress breast. After almost thirty minutes, the violent attack ended. When all had been calm for some time, the sirens announced the departure of the raiders, and I returned with Winter to the compound. There we were struck dumb with dismay. What only a short time before had been a stately complex of granite buildings was almost demolished. With the fall of the college, the fate of the first U-boat flotilla was sealed, and Winter stood amid the ruins of his work. There was nothing he could do but send his last boat out to sea.
I realized that he wished to be left alone and began my slow walk back to my boat. Time, 2120, August 22nd, 1944. Only a few seamen were on deck to handle the lines. I stood on the bridge awaiting Winter's farewell. At 2129, he walked over the gangplank. Returning my salute, he said, Take good care of the boys and the boat and good luck. The same to you, sir. I hope we meet soon under better conditions. Never mind, you get out of here before it's too late. A few commands and the lines were removed from the pillars. The gangway pushed back to the pier. U-953 slid silently out of her berth. She glided toward the middle of the bay, cautiously, noiselessly, so as not to activate any acoustical mines. I brought the boat to a standstill, lowered myself into the hull. Then the chief dropped her routinely for a trim dive. Conditions inside the narrow drum had made a mockery of good seamanship and the regulations for safety aboard a submarine. The centre aisle was blocked by our tourists' precious equipment. Communications between the various compartments were seriously impaired. The heavy weight of the additional cargo, plus a company twice the normal size, created extraordinary problems for the chief to master. It took him over an hour to establish the buoyancy and balance that he required to handle any emergency. U-953 surfaced and crept into the shadow of our escort, probably the only one still afloat. The night was moonless and pitch black. The escort began to move. U-953 followed. When we passed the submerged net, I switched to diesels. As the cliffs receded and radar impulses came sparking toward us from dead ahead, I knew that we had already been detected. Suddenly a flare shot into the night 200 metres ahead. At the same moment, the escort began signalling us by small lamp. Warning, English torpedo boats in attack position. Prepare your guns. I had not thought of meeting the British that way. With my calculations suddenly wrecked, I alerted my men at the guns. Search the surface for small boats. Shoot on sight. The flare died down and the water was black again. The escort had stopped, forcing me to do the same. We were now exposed to a menace that we could not see and that we could not fire at because our guns were ineffective against attack from dead ahead. To put up a fight, I would have to turn U-953 around, pointing her bow toward breast and her guns toward the tiny boats. But how could I possibly sail out to sea stern first? I signalled the escort to move forward slowly and shoot flares continuously to force the torpedo boats into deeper waters. But as soon as we got underway, I spotted a dozen shadows launching a swift attack from about 800 metres. I shouted, Both diesels full ahead! Left hard rudder! U-953 swerved reluctantly, exposing her full flank to the attacking enemy for interminable seconds. As my boat completed her turn, our guns began blazing. We raced back into port at high speed, denying the torpedo boats their first chance to aim and release their explosive loads. The small British boats, far superior to us in speed, drew closer quickly in the light of the flares. But then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, the little devils turned and headed out to sea. The incident demolished my hopes for sailing that night, or perhaps any night. These small torpedo boats were not only deadly in themselves, their unexpected appearance indicated the presence of a strong supporting destroyer fleet. It seemed that our return to Brest was irreversible and that we were condemned to blow up our boat and share the fate of the beleaguered garrison. It was near dawn when U-953 sneaked back into port. I told the crew to stay away from the dockers and keep silent about our night's adventure. Then, for the second time, I closed the green curtain around my nook and tried to figure out a way to escape. Only one possibility remained, to risk a submerged exit. This manoeuvre was imperilled by shallow water, mines and heavy current, and it had never been attempted before. But I calculated that if we sailed at high tide, without a telltale escort, we could float toward the narrows undetected, then dive as soon as the water was deep enough to cover our bridge. Then we would have a slender chance to float out of the trap on the outgoing tide. I rose quietly from my bunk, while one hundred men slumbered in full confidence of my ability to sail them to freedom. On my way to report to Winter, I walked through a completely deserted bunker and yard. I found him with his staff in the underground networks. 
Winter looked disturbed, grave and weary, as I reported the torpedo boat incident and described my plan to outsmart the Tommies. He wished me Godspeed, then asked, Will you join me on an inspection tour of the trenches? Sir, I'd like to, but I have to prepare myself for tonight. Haven't had any sleep for days. Winter said grimly, You may miss something that no one else will live to hand down to posterity. Then, concealing his emotion with a casual toughness, he added, Never mind, keep your ears stiff and your head high. I can't come to see you depart. My duty holds me here. Again we shook hands. I turned away with the positive feeling that I would never see him again. At 2.55 on August 23rd, I shoved back the green curtain, put on my leather jacket, stepped into the dimly lighted control room, reminded the chief to submerge very carefully whenever I called for a dive. Then I took my place on the bridge. At 3.05 I sailed U-953 out of the bunker on a voyage of no return. As she silently glided into the night and towards the narrow channel leading straight into the enemy's teeth, I took a last glance at the city astern. The harbour with its vast docks and shipyards was a mere shadow. The college on top of the hill, bombed and devastated, cut a bizarre silhouette into the nightly sky. And above all was the vague contour of the skyline of Brest, a city chained to the cruel history of war, awaiting destruction and surrender. Now I sensed fully, perhaps for the first time, that all was irrevocably lost, the glory, the successes, the triumphs. The past could never be rebuilt. U-953 floated by the abandoned underwater net and sailed like a ghost into the narrows. The dark background of the hills and cliffs covered our escape. At 3.45, the height of the tide, we slipped through the shallow waterway. I sailed by memory, managing to keep the boat in the navigable channel. When the sky in the east showed the first light streaks, we spotted the enemy boats ahead, lying motionless, mere black dots in a purple sea, and the water was not yet deep enough to dive. I continued with low revolutions, avoiding noise, and presented our smallest silhouette to the enemy. A soft hint of colour in the sky heralded dawn as we glided on the outgoing tide towards the blockade. Then I saw sudden motion in the boat's rigid formation. They began to flit across the lazy surface, then headed for the rocks on either side of the passage. At that instant we reached the limit of our surface advance. At 4.23 we dived and emitted a strong sigh. The boat's bow dipped slowly into the sea. For long seconds I watched the motions of the small boats. Then the water gushed into the horseshoe of the bridge. I shut the lid and listened to the water gurgle as it enveloped the boat. Loud, high-pitched propellers beat the surface as the many torpedo boats scurried in various directions through the calm sea. The moment the chief had finished trimming U-953, I made my calculated moves, lowered her to 15 metres and rigged her for silent running. Three depth charges detonated harmlessly at a distance. 440. U-953 sank to 20 metres. A greater number of the racing boats crisscrossed above our overloaded drum, dropping hand grenades to scare us. 508. Six depth charges exploded starboard ahead. Countless high-pitched propellers skimmed the surface and kept us sweating and guessing in the moist coffin. 520. A spread of twelve canisters detonated seaward. Asdic pings began to flash through the shallow depth. A new series erupted starboard ahead thundered through the coastal waters and echoed long after. 6.45. The boat floated at 40 metres. The torpedo boats cruised resolutely far astern, still throwing hand grenades. Across the forward section, from Cressant to the southernmost cliffs of Brest, the ocean vibrated from depth charges dropped at random. 7.30. I changed course to south-southwest and lowered the boat to 50 metres. 8.10. We had floated 20 miles over ground, had hit sandbanks several times, but always the current had lifted our drum gently over the uneven floor. Several miles ahead, four destroyers zigzagged at medium speed. On starboard, another killer group sounded out the depths for the fugitive. By now, our civilians were dying a slow death of fear and tension. Nine o'clock, we steered a new course of 200 degrees. Unable to see or to orient myself by instrument, I was governed by intuition. 
With both motors off, I let the boat float and slide above ground on a cushion of air in the southbound current. As Dick Pings hit the steel hull with intensified force as action on surface increased. 9.40, low tide had arrived. The chief put the nose of the boat into the sandy bottom, 85 metres below the hunters. All around us were the nervously churning propellers of a dozen destroyers. They constantly drew circles, stopped, sounded, dropped their charges, regrouped, raced ahead, stopped again, probed, dropped charges which drove us against the rocks and turned our hull into a torture chamber. Noon, U-953, her bow turned into the current, swayed gently like a pendulum. Explosions and propeller noises kept every man on alert, yet the water-grey, muddy, warm water full of algae and ocean debris seemed to protect our boat from detection. 1630. The tide began to fall, the current reversed and headed out to sea. U-953 lifted her nose and resumed her motion over ground. Enveloped by a rattling, chirping, booming veil of sound, the boat slowly glided into the Bay of Biscay. As the noise slowly faded, it became apparent that we had evaded the British ships and slipped out of the trap. We were free, but the captives of our own smells. A horrible stench filled the narrow steel drum, emanating from the many sweating bodies, from fuel oil and grease and the overflowing sanitation cans. Some of the shipyard engineers vomited, 